for making sense of becomings, of emergences, of propositions, and not just positions. And whether or not that ethics was in fact present in Aaron's talk, we can debate. But one proposition. Design is an art and a science of making accommodations for bodies according to deliberate and not so deliberate strategies with the machines and the almost machines that populate the landscape with us. Architect or engineer, artist or scientist, we make machines of bodies and things. Desiring machines, housing machines, war machines, architecture school machines. Ones where sometimes the bodies are the actors and the things are the actants, and sometimes the things are the actors and the bodies are the actants. These machines are not just rationalizations of processes, they are organizations of collective expression. Technologies are, as many have said, not just ontological, they are ontology. An architecture, the genuine intellectual pursuit of architecture is ontology. It is a claim making about what itself is, what bodies are, what spaces are, what networks are, what information is, what production is, what consumption is. And in that, building makes thinking as much as thinking makes building. It is also a programmatic proposition and a pragmatic proposition. What something does is what something is. Natalie Jeremijenko's work is resolutely ontological and fiercely practical. She works between and amongst so many different disciplines that even those who know her work well, and she and I first met 10 years ago sharing a panel at Berkeley, have difficulty describing the categories one should understand her work through. Normally, her work is described through its means as a technology pursuit. And to the extent that she is interested in producing new images of the character of technology in and as our lives, this is not inaccurate. But more important, as I see it, it is a challenge to the specificity of the body. The history of architectural theory is rich with corporeal metaphors, with notions of buildings as having properties, poetics, and principles similar to the body and of bodies as having themselves architectonic qualities. For the most part, the relationship across the metaphorical divide has been one of rather polite, if rigorous, counter-reflection. The possibility of quite directly dealing with architecture as a body, and with bodies as architectural media, is perhaps a contemporary development. Natalie's work sits here somewhere at a time when advanced technologies, genetic, cybernetic, political, seem to be either erasing the body into pure information or reviving it as some kind of fundamentalist simulation. Her work is positing, making propositions about the possibility of a body-centered public morality through the use of advanced technologies. In this, her relentless and ironic hacking of the machinic status quo, Natalie prosecutes a social culture that has deep trouble first understanding what its bodies and its technologies are, let alone how to build with them. In this, she is, in my book, one of the most challenging and inspirational architects. It's my pleasure to present Natalie Jeremijenko. Well, that's the first introduction in which promiscuity, propositions, and positions have all been mentioned. Thank you. Um, I um, thank you for inviting me to the celebrated SIARC. And tonight, I'm actually going to talk about 
The opportunity that interactive and internet-based technologies provide to restructure participation in knowledge generation. Now let me actually give you a, that's a, a long sentence. Um, just gone and changed its display. Excuse me for a minute. How did it do that? It was okay before, right? You saw that. <laughs> okay. Um, while I'm fiddling with this, I'm going to fiddle and... Do you, want, do you want to come and change the display settings so I don't actually waste um, the valuable attention of if, if I just escape from here, and just if you go into the, that that uh, display setting, yeah, and just change it to actually, I can do this. Uh, displays. Um, we went to oh, actually we worked. We want this one. And the, and the other one. That should be okay. Okay, yeah, you got it. Okay. 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 So um, this is what I'm going to talk about and why. Because it seems to me like it's the right thing to uh, talk to architects about. I've actually enjoyed watching... I'm not an architect, I confess. I'm an engineer by training and... Uh, um, and uh, I don't know what else. But um, um, I have enjoyed watching the discipline of architecture claim information technology, inventing information architecture, um, and talking about navigation of information space and the intuitiveness of the spatial organization of knowledge. It's a strange and peculiar land grab, but quite challenging to make sense of. After all, there's bioinformatics. There's eco-informatics. Why? What would architecture informatics? Uh, anyway, um, so an architectural approach to information technology lends certain advantages in the mire of the politics of knowledge. That is, who gets to make, interpret, and generate knowledge? Whose information counts, and whose information doesn't? The view from nowhere that uh, all-seeing comprehensive structure is impossible. Um, is impossible uh, from this viewpoint. Knowledge is uh, situated, partial, incomplete, and reinterpretable. Um, its attention to materiality couldn't be more appropriate in a media that claims to be immaterial. So that's a good start, but probably the most productive contribution is that architecture is always dealing with communities rather than isolated users. And this is something that the human-computer interaction community um, and the interactive uh, design community is yet to realize. Um, because community is a horrible word that smears everything with nostalgia and homogeneity, I am going to, oh, closer, louder. I'm going to avoid that word. Um, however, um, to make it sort of a simple point to begin with, I am going to start with the following animation. Okay. Um, this is a simulation that takes the case of museums. Uh, specifically the curatorial statements that are published in museums, right? Um, and in trying to design institutions to be more participatory, new, tech, new information technologies has, of course, been introduced into museum spaces. Um, traditionally, let me play this for you. Traditionally, the curatorial statement in the museum is published and, and uh, placed on the wall because of the... Um, social convention of silence while reading. Uh, people are spatially synchronized, but they are not temporally synchronized. 
people don't talk to each other, right? And the reverent silence of the museum space is preserved. Um, recently, you'd all be experienced um, with the uh, phenomena, or the way that information technology has been introduced into this application with uh, audio tours in the museum, right? Of course, these, uh, you can see here, the simulation is uh, showing someone, Getty, I think the Getty has the ones that you hold up to your ear, right? um, or the earphones. So in this case, you are now temporally synchronized rather than spatially synchronized, and uh, you don't talk to anyone because you, you can't hear them, right? Um, so, um, the alternative for sort of introducing the sort of the effect of that that viewing condition is of course privatizing and, and personal um, information technology exhibiting the curatorial statement can also be presented as a, in a located sound context this is a little located sound instrument that requires a gesture to to initiate it uh, because it's audible, just, uh, it pierces that reverent silence of the, of the museum space. It changes the viewing condition. It promotes, uh, because, it, because it's audible, it incites comment back. Because it's audible, it uh, synchronizes people both spatially and temporally. Uh, this simulation that you're seeing, this um, network simulation of information exchange in a socio-technical network, is um, in, in fact based on empirical data um, that uh, over, over several, actually 146 studies that I've done of, of this phenomenon. And it tends to work a little better in... Um, in, uh, in showing the cumulative effects of social networks. Um, I worked with Eric Schuldenfrey on this animation, and I think it's a pretty good way, um, certainly the best way I've come up with, to show simply and legibly the dynamic and cumulative effects of social networks of information exchange that mathematically express the 2N effect um, why the network or network growth is ex exponential and not linear. Um, so, as you can see on this graph, I actually invite you to download this animation, animation and reuse it as you like. Um, it seems to work better in displaying the phenomenon than this, the, than this graph. And shows quite simply that more things happen in public space or participatory space. We might otherwise call the commons or the information commons to translate it into the information age. So this animation was actually developed as part of a design competition um, for Art in General, uh, downtown Lower Manhattan um, Art Museum. The, in the space were prototypes of the located sound devices that were triggered by pulling out um, a card or a marble that were um, tangible things that one may or may not take, and a token. Um, these actually had a phone number for the Art in General line, so not only could you listen and participate in the space, uh, one could call and leave a comment on a publicly read-writable database. This is actually the U-Phone application, um, which was developed to redress the structure of participation in public databases. So again, the art in general space was really actually trying to explore what it would take to create a more participatory context. I may have just done the same thing again. Okay, I think I have. I did indeed. All right, so let me introduce you to uh, another application of this, um, this technology. 
the UFONE application, uh, the anti-terror line in this case. This is a project um, that enables cell phones, any, any cell phone, to be reconfigured as a microphone. In here you can, um, please turn your cell phones on if anyone has one here. Um, and it uses the pervasive technology to capture data on the insidious social phenomena phenomenon, the uh, infringements on civil liberties in the name of anti-terrorism, made legal through the Patriot Act and the proliferation uh, in the name of war and suspicion. The input side to the anti-terror line is not unlike most voicemail systems where you can record anything after, as we hear many times a day, the beep. In the event of an anti-terror attack, as you're being escorted off the plane for the national emergency of using the first class bathrooms while the coach bathrooms were busy, or had your equipment seized and destroyed because the airport security didn't know what it was, um, or chased by eight um, state officers and federal police and dragged off a train for wearing rollerblades in Grand Central Station, as are my recent experiences in the arbitrary exercise of unfettered post-September 11th power. I can only imagine what it's like for those with less convenient ethnic histories or inconvenient racial looks or a bad attitude. Okay, so maybe that's my problem, but. Um, with the phone number programmed into the quick dial of your phone, you can see it here, 212-998-3394, uh, um, you can, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with one, excuse me, I'm just turning off my phone, you can discreetly record the events. Your recording will be uploaded in near real time to the anti-terror web page. The file will be named simply by the time of recording. It takes about five to seven minutes to appear, and later you can annotate the file, describe the event if you like. The sound quality is not, probably not great. Or someone else can, or you both can. You can, of course, call up any time and leave a report. You can attribute it or not. Um, you can use it as evidence or not, but it is there, at least a trace of the event marked and accumulated, accumulating, publicly writable, publicly readable. So most of these anti-terror events that compromise civil liberties are by themselves inconveniences and inactionable. However, the accumulation of many of these micro-incidents may provide evidence for a definitive response, or for many. Um, can I just ask, if, as, am I alone? Has anyone else suffered the same kind of civil liberties infringements or inconveniences? What has code yellow meant to, to you? I know librarians have been asked to release borrowing records, and in Australia they do, uh, which is interesting. Has anyone else got an anti-terror event experience? And we do? Okay. So do you have a cell phone? And we're going to just do a little demo. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, and just dial this number, 212. <laughs> 998-3394. Actually, a little tip for, if you use the either the at symbol or AT for anti-terror, or at it, it's on the top of your quick dial list and, and is, is right there when you need it next time you're being accosted. You know what, the, um, let me pull this up in Explorer. So can you speak loudly enough into it so we can all hear your anti-terror event? <laughs> yeah, just as a beep, yeah, it, and now it's recording.
Right. Fantastic. That's um. Thank you. That's great. We're going to um, upload this. <laughs> a vivid, <laughs> a vivid demo. It might take a while, but it um, it's a. Um, I mean, I think it, it, we're all terrorists, right? Now, um, actually, you'll, if we scroll down here just for a bit of entertainment value, my well, I won't actually use up the server. My favourite one was recently at Heathrow Airport, um, actually about a month ago, where I was um, prevented from getting on the British Airways plane because I was wearing a T-shirt with a gun on it, and uh, so I volunteered to take it off, and they. Um, <laughs> which is also not acceptable, so I was... Um, anyway, there's, there's, uh, this is on here as well. So, um, uh, and nonetheless, we can contrast this project to the anti-terror line, or the anti-terror line with Attorney um, General John Ashcroft's project, recruiting millions of Americans to report activity they think is suspicious to law enforcement authorities. This comparison between the anti-terror line and the terror line, if you, if you will, is actually, it's actually called Operation TIPS, which stands for Terrorist Information and Prevention System. But I think terror line is better, don't you? Um, Ashcroft, though not an information technology expert, had to defend the technical design of his system, and he did not have an easy time. Ashcott had to assure members of the Senate Judiciary Committee on July 25th that reports of suspicious activity would not be retained in a central database, which of course they are, but as he told the Senate Committee, he did not want them personally to be kept permanently in a central database. Um, we get used to these kind of Bush uh, administration uh, <laughs> things. After Clinton, it's... Uh, it all means the same. Anyway, the Bush administration launched Operation TIPS in 10 cities in August 2002, targeting up to 1 million American workers who, in their daily course of their work, are in a unique position to see potentially unusual, suspicious activity in public places. According to Operation TIPS website, the TIPS volunteers, as they were called on the official site, specifically truck drivers, mail carriers, meter readers, train conductors, and other workers, are supposed to report what they see in public areas and along transportation routes, file the report on the government website, or by calling a toll-free hotline. They are volunteers because they are not paid to assume the costs of looking for, finding, and acting on suspicions that tear at the very fabric of social interaction. I'll come back to this. Both the terror line and the anti-terror line exploit the distributed presence of many people and their actual intelligence, judgment, and experiences. But although their topic or purpose, and at least on the surface their technology may se seem similar, they have very different structures of participation. We can recognize that one has a power asymmetry um, in the first three digits. The terror line is a toll-free 800 number offered by larger entities, businesses, and sometimes government agencies to lower the barriers to participation. To those with more money, um, often a good proxy for power, uh, although the cost of an 800 a number scales with the number of participants, they do not compare with other so-called intelligence gathering agencies. Um, so to skip through a bit. The anti-terror line exploits both the distributed filtering and the distributed judgment of many intelligent people. Anyone can go to the website and see other contributions, judging if they have anything of value to add to it, if and how their experience compares, learning what a civil liberties infringement is. I mean, what the fuck are they? Um, however, Learning if and how to contribute is difficult to do in the case of closed databases, right? And that means you get much more junk and you have to pay someone to go through all of these contributions and filter them instead. In the terror line, workers were asked to be surveillance cameras, collecting information for a powerful entity without consent of those that they were collecting information about, and then without being able to control how the information is interpreted. By contrast, in the anti-terror line, costs are distributed, will cost you and anyone who uses it 10p in England or 25 cents in New York, and I'm not sure what that call just cost you from um, LA, but 
Uh, both are publicly writable, but only the Terra line is publicly readable, which also makes it publicly interpretable and reusable by many people for many situations. The, this may amount to nothing, but the probability of anti terror line files being used for many different things, a documentary radio show, a classroom lecture, a remix into an ambient track, is much higher than the evidence collected by the terror line, which is why the cumulative effect of an open database is extraordinary. Although both require participation, I would describe the anti terror line as participatory. The good news is that the anti terror or that the terror line was stopped and the anti terror line is actually about to be launched. November one. Um, you have a sneak preview. <laughs> um, so and by the way, if you'd like to set up your own UFone you can, um, the scripts and the instructions, uh, and you need to get a special modem, but a apart from that, it's a, you know, it's a $40 modem. Uh, they're all downloadable on the Bureau website. Another application of the uh, U-phone is the Sparrow line. Now, I bet you didn't know that um, uh, there's been a catastrophic population decline in the sparrow population in uh, both London and New York, 98 to 100 percent decline in London, where they monitor these things more carefully, and something of that order in New York. No one knows why this species that has cohabited with Western civilization for hundreds and hundreds of years has catastrophically declined or almost disappeared. Um, it's been blamed on cell phones, isn't everything, and unleaded fuel and a myriad of other causes, but we don't know. Shakespeare, however, or rather Macbeth, auspiciously claimed there is prophecy in the death of a sparrow. And perhaps there is. But now if you spot one, you can call the sparrow line, record the event. I saw one. <laughs> and, uh, and record it. And for uploading, you can actually download a sparrow chirp cell phone ringtone so that when you receive a call, it will chirp like a sparrow, replenishing the fabric of the urban soundscape or perhaps just amplifying the loss. Okay. Um, available for your application. Okay, let me go back here. What was I going to talk about? Uh, oh, I wanted to show uh, another couple of um, quick um, audio projects that are restructure uh, participation in actual space. Um, I'm anxious to, to show real space projects rather than just internet-based projects to this community. Um, so uh, these are a couple of older projects from an uh, exhibition called Neologs in the uh, storefront for art and architecture, which um, really examined the question of, um, well, uh, without going into it. Quickly, uh, real time is um, uh, this exhibit that's pictured here in, in the storefront. Um, and it makes the argument that the institutional context, the specific place matters in, of course, this delusion of um, cyberspace where we pretend that everything is immaterial, that it's a wholly different kind of space. Um, here, there, um, there's a microphone, it's a parabolic mic that you can see pictured that records the ambient sound or records all the interactions along those of you who are familiar with the um, storefront for art and architecture. It's a, it's a small scale of this building, incredibly <laughs> long, slim, slender space. Um, and the parabolic mic actually collects all, the, um, all of the sound propagated um, perpendicular to the axis. So it's recording constantly. And then there's a speaker that's playing back constantly. The trick is, so much 
took, but there's a one-year lag between the recording and the playing back, uh, which means, of course, that next time you come back to an opening there, you can mediate what you said last time a year later. Um, however, it's actually been installed in the, um, the real-time uh, interface, which actually is now called the Interface to the Future, has been installed in the Montefiore Children's Hospital in the Bronx, in New York. Um, here, I've had to do things like uh, do a use scenario. Um, and the Montefiore Children's Hospital is a place where critically ill children spend a lot of time. Um, from this scenario of use to kind of amplify the contextual setting, the recording, um, you know, a, a nurse or a patient or a parent might uh, wheel a child past the interface of the future and say something like, would you like to say anything to the future? And the response from the kid might be, sure, I am Jimmy, I'm six, and when I hear me again, I'll be seven. Or, oh, I ain't coming anywhere near this place again. Or, hi, did I make it? Of course, in this context, it really matters. Everyone who's had a critically ill child knows what it means to take a child back to a place where um, this has happened. Um, place matters. Specific places. Specific experiences. Um, I was going to do this one first. Actually, this is, um, this is my most requested project, so I thought I'd show it to you. Um, this is actually the bone conduction interface which uh, bone conduction interfaces are used in a lot of uh, sound compromised environments, scuba diving or um, in work environments where there's a great deal of, of noise. Um, and what you do is you bite down on the, uh, on the interface so that it actually couples, makes mechanical, a mechanical connection with the resonating chambers of your head. In this case, the bone conduction interface is placed at kneel height outside my office at NYU in the Center for Advanced Technology. And for students who are interested in um, my office hours and availability, they have to come and kneel uh, in order to listen. <laughs> um, it is my only opportunity to subjugate my students, and I enjoy it. But it does make the power relationship explicit. Um, all right, I think I, um, <laughs> yes, I wanted to give you a quick update on the um, One Trees pro uh, project, um, just let me uh, click through. Um, One Trees, for those of you who don't know it, is um, a thousand trees, genetically identical trees that have been uh, planted in pairs throughout the San Francisco Bay Area in public sites um, over the next 60, let's say 100 years, uh, these trees will render the social and environmental differences to which they're exposed, rendering the, uh, the spectacle of the uh, environmental differences in the San Francisco Bay Area um, with a remarkably slow rendering engine actually. Um, so I've recently published the One Trees Map for Bikes and Birds, um, which is a, um, a handy dandy uh, handheld device, high resolution handheld device. Um, it's designed to be operated with one hand while riding a bike at 35 miles per hour. Right. Um, and on uh, one side, you'll see that uh, it marks. Can you see this? It marks all the uh, bike trails between the different public sites where the uh, trees are planted in pairs. They're planted in pairs, so you can see the inter-pair differences, as intra-pair differences, as well as the differences between the pairs. So it has the bike trails between the uh, the pairs. Um, it also has some other useful information, um, sort of 
on top of laid on top of the um, Landsat 7 image is the uh, volunteer data collection of the song sparrow ranges in these white shaded areas, um, completely volunteer collected. And also, you can't see very well, but these little black spots pass them around, are the toxic release inventory sites that are daily emitting toxic uh, chemicals into the environment, particularly the air. Um, and uh, some other handy dandy information. On the other side, we zoom in a couple of, uh, to um, another, uh, actually, slice of the Landsat uh, image to look at the hot or not map, um, which is the uh, heat bands. Uh, that is the, you can see here the sort of, actually go. Um, you can see here the differences. I know I have to stay on my mic. Okay. Um, you see uh, that, like, the, up to the 12 degree differences, that 12 degree Celsius differences that you can get between a vegetated block and a non-vegetated block. Those of you in LA would be very experienced with this heat island effect. Um, it happens, of course, in temperate San Francisco as well. Um, and here it renders, obviously, in green, uh, quite legibly healthy vegetation. And, uh, and the isotherms are the, the heat island effect for the different, um, the different regions. We zoom in again to the aerial photographs of the site at the top. And uh, these actually have uh, data from the 2000 census, which include the address and uh, an aerial photograph, a long lat, and also the median income differences uh, at these different sites, some of the um, remarkable, the remarkable context of the San Francisco Bay Area is that the uh, median income differences between East Palo Alto and West Palo Alto is greater than the median income difference between La Jolla, San Diego, and Tijuana, Mexico, to to give um, sort of the context of how. Um, so I might pass these around, given that this is. mention this project um, because, well, two things. You're invited to come to the One Trees two-wheel uh, bike tour or workshop in, uh, in March of uh, next year. It's just been rescheduled, actually. Uh, where we'll actually be, you know, like a Tour de France, we'll be riding from the different sites and various sweaty, fat, white academics will be presenting at the various sites to the local audiences and, and the workshop of, of ecologists and arborists and people who are working with me to read these trees. Um, we're shooting it like a, like a sport event, a sporting event, right? So with all those camera angles to... to um, anyway, you're invited on the bike ride. And secondly, um, Pond, which has been um, San Francisco art activism and ideas space, um, which has been co-producing this project with me, um, has just issued a request for proposals for the design of signage and street furniture and other interventions um, for each of the One Tree sites. So um, you're invited to, I think, the potential of this audience to contribute to that um, project would be uh, tremendous. Each of the um, one Tree Sites um, is commissioning a, a, a different project. Okay, so um, here are some of the sites actually shot from the rocket cam. On the website you can, uh, I won't pull it up now, but um, you can, each tree site has actually been documented by shooting a rocket with um, a video camera in it. At, uh, spectacular way to see a tree site. Here they are as babies. Here they are actually when they were first exhibited all together. Recall that they're genetically identical and have certainly at this point been raised in identical environmental conditions and yet they look different. Clones, they look different. This has infuriated my public. <laughs> 
I can tell you this here that of course they are the more different. People come to see the clones and they feel cheated, right? <laughs> you flaky artist, what are you doing? Um, they're not really clones. Uh, they look different, right? So such is the, the measure of the public imagination that, that genes are the code of life, right? That genes somehow completely, comprehensively define organisms. This is a simple material demonstration that even here, where the branching patterns, the leaf number, and the very form of these little plantlets is quite different. Although they're genetically identical, although they've been raised in identical environmental conditions. Um, okay, so just skipping through some, this project. Oh, this is the, uh, the, the tree that's being planted is actually the paradox tree. It's an F1 hybrid of a native Californian black walnut and a commercial English walnut. Um, it's called the Paradox Tree. It was named such by um, Luther Burbank at the turn of the century, actually. And it was the first uh, organism or the first time he had observed this phenomena of hybrid vigor, where crossing two kind of puny parents. Um, you can see in the foreground of this image here, this is a, that's a commercial English walnut. That's actually a walnut. Um, orchard in front of it. And that monster at the back is a paradox tree. So um, I've been planting them around. That's what they'll look like in 100 years. I mean, they're magnificent, wonderful, extraordinary trees. Um, rare, uh, but not genetically engineered. Um, I'm going to skip through this project because I'm going to go on to introduce you to the Feral Robotic Dogs project. You may or may not be familiar with the, uh, with the phenomena, the social phenomena of robotic dogs. There's about 17 of them on the market. Does anyone have a robotic dog? Nobody? Well, I first actually became interested in the phenomena when someone gave me a robotic dog and I wondered what that meant for my capacity to love and, you know, my companionship, right? What, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> but um, anyway, it spawned the idea of the feral robotic dog project. So let me just read you um, the warning label out there in the happy family homes, in the offices of corporate executives, in toy stores throughout the globe, is an army of robotic dogs. These semi-autonomous robotic creatures, although currently programmed to perform inane or entertaining tasks, begging for plastic bones, barking the tune of the national anthem, walking in circles, are actually fully motile and awaiting further instructions. So if you had a robotic dog, this is where you would come to to upgrade the raison d'etre of your robotic dog. Uh, the website takes you through how to mechanically upgrade these dogs. That is to uh, actually um, widen the wheelbase, so gently amputate the legs and, um, in fact, insert uh, dogs. This is actually not the website. I'm a little reluctant to, maybe I will pull up the website. Um, before I do that, actually. Um, takes you through the mechanical adaptation of your dog. So these things are actually really domestic creatures. They, ca they can't even handle carpet, let alone uh, outdoor terrain. So to create sort of all-terrain vehicles um, requires some re-engineering. Um, it also takes you through um, giving them a new nose right, and a new brain, sort of a bit of upgrading their brain, such that um, the new nose is environmental toxin sensor 
and the new brain actually now tells the dog instead of barking the well as well as barking the national anthem um, to follow concentration gradients of the toxin that it's sensing. Okay, so here's the um, website uh, um, and the so, the, so actually um, now at Yale, I'm pleased to, to t inform you that uh, you can now take a course in feral robotics in the engineering school. Um, and of course, uh, there's a number of sort of projects involved in this. Um, first of all, uh, or a number of sort of goals or aims of this project, the uh, by exploiting the distribution power and the markets of scale of corporate toy companies, we can uh, actually get these robotic technologies far cheaper than you could ever get it. Even sort of purchasing the same set of sensors, motors, and, and uh, a few wheels is, uh, you know, surplus secondhand would cost you more than $29.99 or $14.99 um, or $4.99 in some cases. Um, in the special pages of, of KB Toys. Um, there's a, just to remind myself of the project missions. Uh, the, um, so the second thing is of course using this distributed hardware platform to create a networked community interested in the transformation of robotic dogs inexpensively. So this web-based community uh, currently uh, openly shares low-cost adaptation strategies and um, for updating this, the rationale or hacking these toys. And this can be contrasted, I think, very explicitly to Sony produced the IBO, which you can get for $2,500. Um, and, um, and currently we have a group in um, Trondheim, Norway, interested in sensing the um, Radiation, how radiation has shifted since Chernobyl. Norway got a, a lot of fallout from Chernobyl. Uh, in Belarus, similarly. In Boise, Idaho. In um, at Pratt, at Yale, and uh, a few other places. Uh, thirdly, and of course, the main project is to. Um, That's interesting. Um, is to create the mediagenic event of the feral robotic dog pack release. Right. So let me go here. Um, so. Uh, in this case, uh, actually the first feral robotic dog pack release we had was in Florida at a site called Baldwin Park, which is, um, was a naval base and is currently, let me actually turn that down, um, is currently being turned into a residential, or is a residential development. Um, we worked with 12 film students who had no previous, um, or little previous programming in electronic uh, experience to upgrade um, 12 of these dogs and um, for release on this site of community interest. So this, um, this site is in downtown Orlando and um, curiously well, the particular part of the site that we um, chose was the middle school which was um, built or is being built on a, um, a known contaminated site of volatile organic compounds, right? Uh, this was surprising to me to begin with, but it turns out that this is actually a relatively common phenomena to build schools on toxic waste dumps, actually. Um, this is uh, a, simply because um, 
real estate is uh, toxic waste dumps are cheap, schools are poor, and so the two of them go together a lot. Um, there you go, the Baldwin side. So we um, we released a pack of dogs on this site, um, inviting local community members, media, activists to witness the feral robotic dog pack release. So, um, of course, what we're doing here is um, rendering the information with the movement of the dogs, right? And what this strategy does is render it legible because the dogs appear to be sniffing something out. Um, they, it's rendered legible to, you know, your grandmother, even to a uh, sort of a television journalist, um, or uh, um, or a kid, right? Anyone can see where the um, uh, concentration gradients lie, where the toxins are, and it's this. This capacity, and there's a number of other design issues in, in sort of redesigning robots so that they're not intelligent machines, but let's call them intelligible machines. Um, and perhaps I think the best or the most explicit feature is the placement of the little webcam, which in typical robotics you put the webcam where the eyes would be, right? Because of the fiction that robots are alive, right? Um, Furby or, you know, these um, Cog or, or some of the other famous robots. The, um, uh, however, in the feral robotic dogs, the webcams are not placed here. They're actually placed in the non-barking end, if you will, to demonstrate. Um, and hence, they shoot back at the people who are following them, who are saying, why is it going up? You know, what are they doing? Who are the real-time interpretation. They're privileging that sense-making as information rather than just the data itself. Okay, so um, currently there's uh, well there's a number of sites of community interest that we're working with, but perhaps um, the ones that we're uh, working towards for this semester are of um, wider community interest, that is uh, international community interest, um, and that is the um, sites in Iraq, Iran, and surrounding regions, Bosnia, um, where over 800 ton of depleted uranium has been dumped by US and UK forces in the last two, force, uh, two Iraq wars. Um, okay. I'm sorry I didn't cue this. Um, Nonetheless, if you have a dog, we take, uh, we adopt, you know, if you want to dump a robotic dog or if you know anyone who does, we take them and uh, we, uh, I want to get to this good part and I'll stop. This guy was great. Now, do we have the sound? Okay, so He's saying, to go down. Are we, are, are we here now? We're in here? Anyway. Uh, very quickly, we were thrown off the site um, to, uh, to sort of, but there's, we've had a number of, of releases since, um, including one at um, Bronx River uh, in Bronx, actually um, at Starlight Park, which is uh, another VOC contaminated site. Con Edison has known, this, uh, Starlight Park has a, it's been a park for 50 years, it's a Con Edison owned site and um, they've actually had records that it's a manufactured gas plant from the turn of the century with um, severe um, VOC contamination. Um, this was not released to the public until the Christian Youth um, local Bronx Christian Youth Group uncovered this fact and uh, and um, uh, confronted Con Edison with this um, fact. Uh, so it's currently under remedial side investigation. Uh, okay. So, oh, here's the uh, here's the getting thrown off.
<laughs> no, no, no. Not out here. This but they dogs. The owner of Baldwin Park. They're down in the trailer yeah. down the road. Yeah, I spoke to them. What did they say? I told them we had these little robots. Mm -hmm. This is a construction yeah, site. We have okay. traffic equipment running everywhere. Okay. Um, you don't want us on here because Absolutely of not. Because of liability reasons. Hard hat, safety glasses, okay. insurance, the whole nine yards. Well, so if we wear the hard hats? No. You need to be That's escorted out the, on out site, the bottom off of one of the dogs, park. right? <laughs> There's absolutely okay, so no way we can have y'all out here. Can y'all get your stuff picked up and we can yeah. discuss it? Alright, this goes on and on. Um, uh, you can download it from the website from a number of the sites. We're also publishing these um, site reports from on the Center for Land Use Interpretation site. Should you... Um, okay, so the last project I'm going to present Back to this. Is um, well, actually, uh, just a, a, the Sparrow Line. Um, I think started to define the type of problem that this sort of participatory media, uh, the sort of knowledge that can be most productively addressed by these participatory models that I'm promoting. That is ill-defined, complex, messy, or multivariate problems that can benefit from the multiple points of view, the diversity of human experience and knowledge, undisciplined knowledge messy environmental knowledge or the messy realm of politics, um, which got me interested in the phenomena of architecture for animals. And I've just opened a show actually last Saturday called The Ooze Project. Ooze is zoo backwards and without cages. Right, it's actually a series of technological interfaces to facilitate interaction between urban human populations and urban non-human populations. Um, these, uh, these actually began with the launch of later um, the robotic goose designed to interact with a local population of geese. Do you get Canadian geese here? They, no. Yes? <laughs> they're, they're everywhere and they're universally despised because they shit, right? <laughs> um, but later um, actually is designed, let me actually, uh, this is actually the site of a building. It's uh, um, that's in the Netherlands. It's in the newest village uh, in Zevolder in uh, the Netherlands where, of course, you know, they build dikes and pump out water and make new land. Um, so they don't have that conceit of pristine nature. They just have um, highly constructed nature. Around this site, this building, is, um, is this population of geese. So um, the interface includes this goose pilot chair where you sit on it. <laughs> And you actually drive the goose robot by, you know, leaning forward, and, you know, as if you're riding up. So you drive the goose robot. It's actually a little lower than this initial prototype, and play with, follow, harass the geese population, the goose population. All right. So you can also talk to the geese by. Um, uh, there's a little light interface, so you have to. So you. So you like this. I mean, you look like a goose to anyway. So you, um, you can issue words, and it turns out that hunters are the best geese linguists, actually. So uh, there's about six words that um, you can issue. Or through ventrilo ventriloquism, you can just say whatever you like to them. Right? That, uh, the interface then actually, it's a little video camera in later, the robotic goose. There's neck actuation you can do as well. Um, and that actually samples back the two to four seconds of reaction that the goose has back. This writes into a database, and then you can 
um, interpret, you know, those geese were telling me to go away, or um, hello, I'm goose, you know. Um, and through this sort of limited vocabulary of this robotic goose interface, the thesis is that, you know, because people do many of the similar things, they all try to harass their geese. However, on Saturday, the, the kids were doing something really interesting, which was driving the goose robot into the reeds, which meant I had to wade into the, I spent a lot of time wading through the, the weeds, retrieving goose robot, um, which was a new hack I hadn't thought of. Um, nonetheless, um, that video database is publicly read-writable. Anyone can interpret what the goose said, compare, sort them along um, noun phrases or um, similarity of interaction or response. It's a whole architecture of reciprocity that includes a number of other interfaces. Perhaps the simplest one is um, this horse interface where the ho it's on actually on the horse's side of the fence where the horse can push the bar one way and it issues a little statement saying, please give me an apple. Or the horse can push it the other way and it'll say, please go away, right? So a device for horses to train people, if you will. Um, and the bat bar or the bat cave, which is coming up. There's a dragonfly observatory as well. Um, anyway, a number of different um, interfaces. The thesis being that this, um, that the ooze enables and is built out of interactions. Um, language, of course, is a messy, complex, distributed phenomenon. Um, it can't be defined by a dictionary and no one has one of those in their heads. Language, shared language, is a distributed phenomenon. The public read writable do database of the Ooze project, of the Goose project in this first part, um, or the thesis of this, the Goose project, is that, of course, through these interactions, through the cumulative interactions, we may learn Goose. Um, the final part of, or another part of the aspect of this, probably the most important part, the fundraising part of this Goose project to which I extend an invitation to all of you, is the Goose Dinner. Not eating the goose, the geese, but in fact um, the Goose Dinner has a menu of that overlap of food that is nutritious and delicious to um, both humans and geese. Um, this is muddy water feather leather made of seed rice and carrigan. Cress rice dumplings, oh that's um, cress and seed moki, moki. Um, and perhaps the, 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 these are the appetizers that we tried out last Saturday and the, the geese actually loved them. And I think that people thought they were going to taste muddy or fishy or something, but they're, they're delicious. I can. <laughs> I guarantee, and the geese love them, of course, which are, um, but it's in these, um, the, the dinner will be much more elaborate and you can buy your plate and the plates are actually made of the mud from the ceramic mixes, um, includes the mud from the, the uh, pond. But these micro interactions, the sharing of food with another species, tells us that we are inside nature, not outside of it, and perhaps best illustrates how our interactions structure participation, our institution, and our knowledge. Thank you. If you don't st ask questions, I'll start showing you more projects. <laughs>
you work as a team, you do have like fun with my that's not like a really serious issue, but there's something that, you know, we're following, we're not following, at least, and really enjoying that, that sort of approach. Is that something that's big about or you do with it? That's just how it's sort of I can't help it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <Yeah. laughs> no, I, I mean, really what. Um, I mean, in terms of the politics of knowledge is pretty um, icky stuff, right? Who cares about how databases are structured? <laughs> Not really many people. Um, but um, I mean, I think that's the power of bringing these experiments and the structures of participation into the public realm, into public spaces, and into um, art institutions, right, museums, um, because, I mean, if we talk about technology and these issues about animal lingu and linguistics and, you know, um, in a scientific context, then, of course, well, there isn't really a public forum for the discussion of techno-scientific issues, right? So, um, most of us wouldn't feel kind of authorized to make assertions about goose language or bat language or, or um, you know, s civil liberties infringements um, because we don't have the, or, you know, in environmental change rendered by the one, because we don't have the evidence, we don't have that material evidence. Um, however, in public and in art institutions, we know the cliche is that, of course, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like, right? People are scripted to have an opinion. Their interpretation matters, that they can, they can say something. Um, and so, and that's, you know, that's what I'm tremendously interested in, sort of restructuring lay expert knowledge, restructuring who makes knowledge claims, who feels authorized to interpret. And in an art institution, in public you know, uh, institutions, anyone feels like they can, but you actually have to use a populist language, right, in order to engage that. Um, so making bad puns and doing sort of, is a, a very specific strategy of, of engaging, addressing diverse audiences. ago there was Aaron Betsky was here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think you're right in that sort of the condition of technology that we face is this diffused accountability where we can't point at anyone and say, can, this sucks, right? I hate Microsoft Word. Or, you know, we can, there's no one we can hold accountable, right? And, and that, you know, then how do you address something that you 
to, for which there's no structures of accountability, right? So, um, I mean, with respect to the authorship of the artist, I think in the case of tech, techno art, um, there is the, there is certainly, well, I mean, I think that, you know, artists have no credibility in the realm of technology and in so much as I'm called an artist, that's, you know, that's uh, tantamount to calling me a fraud, right? <laughs> um, they have dubious degrees and, and certainly untrustworthy, shady characters, artists. I mean, they, they're not like scientists or engineers who are trustable. Um, However, I think that's the very advantage of, of being an artist, is that you stand in for the random individual. You know, you're a proxy for anyone. If artists can make knowledge claims, then anyone can, right? Um, however, if, um, you know, if we, if we leave all of our, you know, if, if we don't seize this opportunity that the internet has presented us with radically new structures of participation, then I think there's, um, it's a really a lost opportunity. Um, with respect to being a re-engineer, I rather like that. I mean, all, all, all design is redesign, all engineering is re-engineering, but there is a, there's a certain, um, you know, engineering science is privileged in the hierarchy of, of, of knowledge and um, and as an engineer, I have to do some of that too, right? I have to do more quantitative risk analysis and precision engineering. And, and in fact, you know, there's some really interesting problems um, with respect to the depleted uranium sensing in, in the dogs using the little solid state sensors um, that are inexpensive and designing them such has, you know, actually been a tremendously productive sort of publishable area um, with its own, you know, I'm talking to a very specific community, but in, in effect, um, what I do in these sort of techno-social engineering, I think should count as engineering, which is why I hang out in an engineering department, um, um, which can often be a hostile environment, but, uh, you know, that's okay. Okay, I think I've... I've scared away a lot of people, so <laughs> thank you all very much for your attention. I really appreciate it.